With the time we have, I basically have one, uh, just one general question for all of you to sort of respond to. Um, before I ask the question, I just want to acknowledge just how beautiful it is to see all these people here. It's, it's really amazing. And I just have to tell this little story because, you know, Angela has heard me tell the story many, many times. Way back, back in the early 90s, uh, when I was just a boy, right? Um, <laughs> not quite, but when Angela gave a talk at the uh, Race Matters Conference in Princeton about abolition and said to a room full of people that, you know, we really need to we need to imagine a world without prisons. You could have heard, you could have heard a pin drop. People are like, what? Huh? That doesn't make any sense. She got so much pushback. And now we're in a room full of people who agree. Yeah. Right? That is progress. Yeah. Progress. Okay? So that said, my last question is, so here we are, just to, to let remind. Let me say, Robert, oh, yeah, okay. that is because of all of the organizing right. that uh, people have done. And I, you know, certainly, I can't take credit for that. Mm. Uh, it's because vast numbers of people, young people, right. people from all kinds of communities over the last uh, 20 years have really been um, seriously persuading people to shift their way of thinking. Right. And, 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 and so I have to say, this is a community, this is a product of community mm -hmm. at its best. Right, absolutely. As, and, and you know, and the other thing is that it's a very important lesson in terms of, of the radical imagination. Because as, so part, of my, part of my point was that, you know, people couldn't conceive of it then. And it took all the organizing work, all the struggle to conceive of a different way. And so that the hegemony of the ruling classes, it's, 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 it's very thin. It's thinner than we think. It can be pushed back. And thanks to artists like Fred and Melanie, thanks to the work that, that all of you do and, and that Angela does, that's how we push it back. So this leads me to the last question, which is you know, just to remind you what Critical Resistance LA has been doing in the No More Jails Coalition, uh, fighting for the proposed $2 billion jail construction plan, um, uh, fighting against it. Uh, the Critical Resistance is focusing on stopping the, also the proposed $120 million women's jail, which uh, Angela mentioned, um, and we know from experience that this is a long struggle, it's a winnable one, but power doesn't always concede all that we desire. So my question just for all of you, both as artists, as activists, as thinkers, uh, what do we do? How do we continue to imagine a world without prisons, um, and what do we gain by making these demands even when we don't win them right away? Um, in other words, how is the radical imagination useful or necessary to stay engaged through struggle? You know, and how can we sustain that? Just in your, your ideas. And we could start with Fred. Well, I mean, I think a big part of it is evenings like tonight, but also imagining the continued forms of, of fellowship in groups as large as this, but, but even more importantly in groups much smaller than this that can emerge as a function of all of us being here tonight. Um, and it's not just about the ways in which we get together to fight what it is that the state and capital are trying constantly to do to us. Mm -hmm. It's also about the ways in which when we get together, we are engaged in that ongoing experiment of how to be together and to live together in a different way. Yeah. Um, right. I think, uh, I, I just, I remember one time actually in, in our house in North Carolina, when you were staying with us one night and I asked this question, sometimes you think for something so long that you, you can finally boil it down to the simplest almost kind of naive question, because it turns out that what you were thinking about was a miracle, right? And I was like, well, how did the civil rights movement even happen, <laughs> you know? Right. It wasn't supposed to happen, right? right. right? It's, right. It, 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 it's, it's miraculous, mm -hmm. okay? Yes. 
And then in the course of, and I began to think after Robin was talking to me that when I think of the meetings, the mass meetings, the meetings that my mom used to, to take me to, um, when I think of all those meetings, I think, what if it turned out that what it is that people were really fighting for was not the right to assimilate into a culture that excluded them? What if they were trying to fight for the right to keep meeting just like that all the time, right. as much as they could, <laughs> without the duress? Right. Um, and it reminds me now of a moment reading this wonderful book um, called Architecture After Revolution by um, these, this, one, of the arch, one of the people who wrote the book is this great um, Palestinian architect and architectural theorist named Sandy Hillal. Mm. And she talked about this practice that Palestinians engage in, a practice of collective land ownership called Almasha. And it's a form of collective land cultivation. And what's amazing about it is that it makes it even, it makes it more difficult for the Israeli state to expropriate land that is cultivated collectively. It's as if they have to posit an individual landowner in order to then to be able to take the land. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And so what she says in this book is that this practice of almasha of collective land ownership, she talks about it as a form of self-defense. It's a mode of practice that actually defends itself in its own practice, right? right? That the more they did it, the more it was able to sustain itself right. against the grain of all that violence. And so I guess what I'm thinking of is some, you know, way for us to continue to cultivate our own habits of El Masha mm -hmm. that we have already been cultivating forever, that Melanie was talking about, that, that this church represents, you know? We just have to keep on practicing getting together. That's right. That's keep right. on practicing living our lives. I think um, something that Angela was saying earlier about how we can reproduce systems of oppression, like that we constantly, like, and what you were talking about, Fred, I think you know, it's really important to acknowledge that there, there are these colonial functions. Like if we're gonna grasp things at the root, there's like a history of colonialism and that there's processes that we have to try to decolonize because right. it, and it's constant and that's part of the struggle. Mm -hmm. And that it, just as much as the demand on the systems, right, there is no, um, way that we're ever going to have anything conceded to us. There's, we have to struggle, mm -hmm. but the struggle is both with those oppressive systems and also with ourselves. And I think the only way that I've been able to see myself experience those things is to do it by building community and to continue to, like, we, we started doing these things called print parties. It wasn't in, in, in the idea of having some celebration of coming together. And what really precipitated it was when um, the prisoners in the SHU called for vertical organizing outside of the prisons. They said, please support what we're doing. And I was like, well, what am I good at? <laughs> I can make art and I can bring people together. And we did that and it was like different organizations came together, people, it was in a SHU store because we don't have a space. But the shoe store said, you can come and use this space for free as long as you want. People brought food. Like, everyone brought a little bit of what they could of themselves. And they brought an open heart. And through that, we started to build something different. And I invited a bunch of artists that, that always wanted to do more mm -hmm. with organizing groups. And it was, like, amazing. People went to, to hear young people talk about what it was to be in solitary confinement in juvenile justice centers for the very first time. They had never gone to Sacramento. They went out and gave like the art that was made. We made over 400 posters in the course of a rainy day, which I didn't think anyone was gonna show up. Um, so like for me, it's like to not let 
fear of not having done it before or of it not being exactly the most perfect way keep us from trying to decolonize and to do it together and to like engage around like learning and being accountable if we misstep but not crushing each other if we make a mistake. Right. Well, I want to um, continue along the lines that both Melanie and Fred have been speaking. You know, how to how do we make community, uh, and how do we make community that is attentive to what has happened before mm -hmm. and what can happen afterwards. Uh, we. People are always um, remarking that um, we've been doing this work forever, right? We've been, we've been um, dealing with police violence and killer cops forever, since slavery. Uh, and that sometimes it appears as if nothing has changed. We keep repeating over and over again but I think that a great deal has changed at the same time because we know so much more. Right. So if we, if we are able to um, gr grasp the lessons that come to us from those who came before and those who are coming afterwards, which means that um, the intergenerationality of our work has to be serious. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, and it's not only a question about respecting the elders. Uh, it's also a question about elders learning from the youth, mm -hmm. the young people. Because young activists, if they are really doing their job, are really standing on the shoulders of those who came before. Therefore, they're standing a little bit higher than those of us who are older. And so how do we build community that allows us really to learn from each other and to respect each other uh, and to take care of each other? What, what, what we are learning, those of us who are older, are learning from young people is the absolute importance of self-care. Mm -hmm. And a kind of self-care that is not individualistic, uh, that is collective and a part of the very process of, 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 of organizing. Uh, and then finally, a community that extends uh, uh, in space as well as in time, uh, that is, extends across waters, uh, across all kinds of borders. Uh, and I, I, um, I want to end by referring to something that uh, I, I've already spoken to Robin about, uh, because I mentioned it at the Black Radical Tradition Conference, uh, about this poem by a Palestinian um, poet that was included in an anthology which all of us had if we were involved in the black movement. It was called uh, Enemy of the Sun. Uh, and it was, a, it was an anthology of Palestinian poetry that was uh, produced by a black radical publishing house, uh, Drum and Spear. And the story is this. Um, when George Jackson was killed in San Quentin, and they went and got his papers from his cell, uh, they found among his papers uh, a handwritten um, copy of this poem, Enemy of the Sun. Uh, and it's this really powerful poem that evokes the, the violence and, 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 and the resistance and the determination and persistence as well. And 
it was published in a number of newspapers under George's name because people assumed that this was a poem that was written by George Jackson about black people in the United States. But it was later discovered that this was by a Palestinian poet who was describing conditions in occupied Palestine. Um, and the fact that it could circulate for so long and people could assume that this so perfectly captured what black people had experienced in this country is, um, is an indication of the ways in which we can make uh, community. Uh, uh, and we can make community across the waters too. And at this moment, um, Palestine is really our South Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's really so amazing to see black students and Latino students and uh, all over the country uh, standing up for justice in Palestine. Uh, right. Because I think they recognize that if we can't achieve justice in Palestine, that means that we will have gone a long way in creating the possibility of peace and justice in the world. Absolutely. And don't forget to buy this book. Angela Davis, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement. Before you leave, first let's thank our panelists. Please give it up. <laughs>